Small potatoes are all the marbles. Debriefing the final EIS for the Otter Tail to Wink Wilkin CO2 pipeline. Um, you are here on August 6, 2024, and this webinar slash briefing is hosted by CURE, a rural Minnesota nonprofit. CURE protects and restores resilient communities and landscapes by harnessing the power of the people who care about them. We work in community in rural parts of Minnesota and throughout the upper Midwest um, and, and other places, other places too sometimes, um, to work on things like clean, clean water, um, preserving natural landscapes, and also fighting this whole climate change problem we've got going on. A lot of our work is clean energy, and um, we, we've been around for about 30 years now. Um, yeah. Thank you. So I am Hudson Kingston. I am your lowly moderator, but I'm here with Sarah Moradian, who also works at CURE, and Sylvia Secchi, who is uh, an economics professor, um, although she's not limited to just economics, um, and she spends her time at the University of Iowa. Um, so we will be, I will be talking for a little bit, and then Sarah and Sylvia will, will tell you the real facts and things you need to know. Um, so our agenda today, I'll give a quick overview of what the heck is going on. Um, Sarah will be presenting on what's in the final EIS, which just came out at the end of July. And um, we'll get a deep dive into some important topics with Dr. Sylvia Secchi. And then we'll go, go back to Sarah to talk about the process and what, what you or others may be able to do in response to this final EIS. Um, we will have room for questions at the end, so feel free to drop those in the chat or in the Q&A box. Um, so for those who are not familiar with the summit uh, proposed pipeline network, first of all, there's no summit pipeline, does not exist, but they are proposing to build the Midwest Carbon Express, which would be the largest CO2 pipeline network in the world. Um, it would cross across Iowa, Nebraska, South Dakota, North Dakota, and Minnesota. And it would be more than 2,000 miles and cost more than $8 billion to build. Uh, right now, it is proposed to link up to ethanol plants. So it would be taking carbon dioxide from ethanol plants in all of those states and bringing that um, concentrated carbon dioxide to um, some part of North Dakota so that it could be injected underground. In Minnesota, uh, there are three different segments, and they all add up to about 240 miles, and only six of the 57 ethanol plants are in, in Minnesota for now. Obviously, when you build a network like this, it could continue growing. So this is just to describe the proposed project is the largest carbon dioxide pipeline network in the world. It, it could, of course, grow larger if, if the initial um, blueprint is, is authorized by the states that it goes through. Um, next slide. So what we're talking about today is a short segment that's in um, western uh, central Minnesota and would link one ethanol plant to the border of North Dakota. It's approximately 28 miles, although it could be slightly different because there are three different potential routes. And uh, compared to the cost of $8 billion, it, this one, uh, this segment could cost about $70 million. Um, so that's our question. Small potatoes are all the marbles. This is an environmental review on a relatively small segment of a relatively gigantic and consequential project. And this environmental impact statement, which um, Sarah and Sylvia will be talking about soon, um, is, as far as we know, the only comprehensive environmental review of this project. So it's only 28 miles, but it's also the only assessment of its type um, and, and therefore provides an opportunity for the public to learn and have input on this project. So with that said, um, and having spoken a little too quickly, uh, I'll hand it over to you, Sarah. Go ahead. Thanks so much. All right. So I will preface this by saying, um, you know, we did a, an overview of what was in the draft environmental impact statement uh, back in February. So there's a lot more detailed information um, to be found in there. Um, so this is really just getting down to the nitty gritty kind of of what's in the final EIS. Um, so first of all, what we've seen so far in the last couple of days that we've had reviewing this is that there aren't, from our perspective, major changes from the draft EIS, which was 
the commission's um, public utilities commission's first uh, attempt at doing this environmental review. Um, what we've seen is that there are some common themes. So the 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 FEIS final EIS will acknowledge comments that were received. Um, about certain topics, but there really isn't a ton of additional analysis. Um, and so, you know, we're seeing a lot of a lack of sufficient detail to allow the commission to make an informed decision. Um, so that's things like saying studies or surveys will be done. Um, instead of saying we did the study, here's what it says about potential impacts. That's very broad um, in terms of just kind of common themes that we're seeing, but there are a couple things that are remaining concerns for us that have been held over from the draft environmental impact statement. So the first, public safety. Um, so CO2 uh, is, can in, in a, a high enough quantities be really dangerous, especially if we're talking about a high pressure pipeline like we are here, um, you know, that turns something, um, you know, into a pretty, could be a really dangerous situation if that were to rupture. So after the commission, well, the, the, the Department of Commerce who's doing the environmental impact statement received comments from commenters like here and others about the modeling that was done. Um, they did have their modeler run a couple more models, um, but it was only on part of the modeling. Um, and interestingly enough, some of those models showed that the the potential impact radius or you know the amount of space around a rupture or leak that could be um you know have a dangerous situation in terms of uh, concentration of co2 was actually increased in those situations so that's concerning from one perspective um but also you know we we saw that in the modeling and in the final in environmental impact statement um the department of commerce the feis didn't really address some of uh, the expert comments that were received um, about, you know, certain questions that were assumed in the modeling. Um, so, you know, in terms of how did the model consider the phase that the CO2 was in? That's a little in the weeds, sorry. But are they assuming that it's a gas or are they assuming that it's a liquid? That can impact how the model then says what the potential impact radius could be. So, having no answer to kind of what was assumed is a problem. Um, also seeing that kind of the, the concerns that were brought up um, were in some ways dismissed as kind of insignificant, or, you know, if it's a small chain, if there's a difference between what was modeled and what the um, kind of base modeling software suggests you should use um, for wind speed or something like that, um, saying that the difference between those two is insignificant when the point of modeling is to figure out, you know, exactly what might happen. So being precise is extremely important. So public safety on one hand. Uh, then we've got water use. So we know that um, the applicant summit has said that they think they'll need about 13 million gallons of water annually for operations. Um, but they think they're gonna source that from the existing ethanol plant, but they haven't finalized anything. Um, and there's also not been any studies in terms of whether the the existing water resources in that area in Otter Tail County um, can actually support and sustain that additional use. Um, the applicant says they can, um, but there's really not enough analysis from our perspective in the final EIS to, that looks at whether or not that's true. Then we've got water quality. So unfortunately, we've seen this with um, most recently with the line three. Pipeline, um, we know that construction itself can be extremely damaging to water quality, especially groundwater sources. Um, so we know DNR has said in its comments that there are, and the FEIS says that there are shallow um, confined aquifers in the vicinity of these proposed pipeline routes, all three of them. And we also know that sheet piling, which is used sometimes when you're, you know, um, doing this kind of pipeline construction can breach aquifers. And if that happens, that can have really long-term impacts on groundwater. Um, but the FEIS says, again, kind of this point of lack of uh, information now, lack of sufficient detail now, um, applicant will conduct geotechnical studies, um, geotechnical investigations to figure out what exactly the uh, risk is, where it might be, how best to handle it. Um, but we don't know right now. We don't know what that impact might be. Then there's also concerns, again, we've seen this with line three, with um, it's called horizontal directional drilling. It's a means of um, constructing pipeline. Um, but there is uh, 
a concern with inadvertent releases is what they're called. Um, so the drilling fluid will get then um, kind of released into whatever the waterway is. Um, and again, that can be a problem in terms of water quality, um, introducing uh, materials into um, a, a surface water that we would not want to see. Uh, and then we've got emissions reductions. So Summit assumes and says uh, that it will be able to capture 100% of the CO2 emitted from the ethanol's um, fermentation stack. Um, they say that in the FEIS. Uh, the Department of Commerce kind of takes that at face value. But at the same time, Summit has also said in its air permit to the public, uh, sorry, Pollution Control Agency, that that's more like 95%. Um, and in that air permit, even the uh, Pollution Control Agency said, well, they say it's 95%, but they didn't provide us with any proof. So that's a problem. We don't even know if it can achieve 100% capture rate. Also, it assumes that the FEIS assumes um, generally that it's not going to be used, the CO2 capture won't be used for enhanced oil recovery. Again, for more information, I would direct you back to Kira's previous resources about that, um, but essentially using CO2 to get more oil out of depleted wells. So the FEIS assumes this because Summit says that we're not going to use it. Um, they say that in this docket, but they've said elsewhere that they will absolutely be using it um, if certain shippers um, along their pipeline want to use it for that. Now, the FEIS did take into consideration some concerns that were raised initially in this, and so they do have a new table that updates kind of, all right, well, if it's used for enhanced oil recovery, what kind of emissions might we be talking about if that oil was then, that was recovered through enhanced oil recovery was then burned? But they don't put these things side by side. They don't put the, the um, alleged or proposed emissions reductions from the ethanol facility next to the um, the potential emissions from burning the EOR oil um, next to each other. So it's hard to kind of compare those. Um, but so they're estimating um, that, that, that the facility, if it is able to capture 100% of emissions and does it properly and everything goes the way it's supposed to, um, including being sequestered, that it would be capturing and sequestering about 101 or 161,000 um, tons of CO2 annually. But if that same amount was used to get oil um, out of depleted oil wells, the resulting CO2 emissions from that oil um, would be as high as 272,000 uh, tons of CO2. So just kind of trying to put that into perspective. Um, so the FEIS puts some of that information out there, but you really need to be able to put them together um, yourselves. It's not clear. Um, and again, taking Summit's word for it that that won't be used for enhanced oil recovery. Um, and then this, I'm going to, is my segue um, over to Dr. Sechi. Um, some concerns still remain about soil impacts and impacts and crop productivity. Um, I feel they weren't really answered um, in the FEIS. So I will stop sharing my screen and I will hand it over to you, Sylvia. All right. Thank you very much for having me, first of all. Uh, and here are my slides. So I um, am going to start, um, as Hudson said at the beginning, I'm an economist by training, by looking at how the environmental impact statement uh, considers economic impacts, because I think that it's reflective of the larger issue uh, of the um, EIS that is kind of like taking things at face value and not looking at um, uh, having a more critical perspective and not looking at the literature, right? So as you can see here, this is from the um, uh, the beginning of the, the, um, the executive summary. You can see the applicant says, so they take the applicant's numbers at face value, even though the Ernst & Young report that they are using specifically says, don't use our numbers. Uh, this is the disclaimer that they have at the front of that report, okay? So this is my kind of like first um, broad sets of um, set of critiques because uh, these studies, these, environment, uh, these economic impact studies that show all the benefits of these uh, pipelines uh, are really a PR um, uh, tool. 
Uh, they depend very heavily on the numbers that Summit provides, as you can see here. And these numbers have not been independently vetted, okay? Uh, and because of this reason, Ernst and Young, you know, they do have lawyers over there. They don't want to get in trouble, right? Um, so Ernst and Young says, you know, you can't, this is not designed for use by third parties. And so more specifically, what are some of the issues? Well, uh, the first issue is, and this is taken, um, I took this um, yesterday as I was prepping for this from the Summit website. You can see they use these worker years numbers and these worker year numbers essentially mask how short the construction period is. So, you know, they 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 make it look like they're gonna um, hire like, you know, um, uh, lots and lots of people, you know, 300 worker years, but really what they're going to do is they're going to hire a, a lot of people for like six months to a year. And so what it means is in terms of contribution to the local economy, there's very little. Even if they hire local people, which I'm, I'm going to get back to in a second, it's not like they're providing people permanent jobs. I want to emphasize that these type of pipelines are not labor intensive operations in the long run. The people who would be operating the pipelines, which is what matters because that's the long term employment, are very, very few, okay? And so they mask this. It's a, it's a very well-known fact uh, that the, this reporting worker years hides essentially the, the spikes in employment and then the really rapid decreases in employment that happen with this type of operations. Um, again, you can see here, you know, uh, the this is for the uh, construction period, right? And so even when they have 618 average annual, annual jobs, um, it's it's essentially, uh, you know, over a construction period of three or four years, you have that average, but that doesn't mean that you have people employed for three or, or four full years, okay? Um, this the It's also problematic that they have this induced job numbers. So these are the jobs of people working in the, service industry, you know, in restaurants, in in um, uh, uh, shops that would sell to the employees uh, during that period or to the contractors in that period. Uh, that's, um, you know, th th those numbers have not been vetted. And as you can see here, a lot of those numbers aren't necessarily numbers of full-time jobs. So there is, when you start looking into the weeds, and you start considering the um, economic benefits of these uh, construction periods, you realize that in fact, they're very little, um, that you know uh, some of them are kind of like uh, plucked out of thin air, right? And they're not necessarily very good jobs. I mean, if you have uh, somebody working at the movie theater uh, selling popcorn, uh, because you know there's more people in town going to see movies, uh, that's not necessarily the type of good jobs that we would want, right? Um, and so this uh, brings me to the North Star, the Star report that was really uh, emphasizing that you could have, um, you know, more local jobs if some of the some changes were made to the essentially um, uh, ways in which people were hired. Um, and look at these numbers in terms of millions of dollars of impacts. It is really peanuts when you compare it with the amount of money that you see at the bottom in the figure. We're talking about $7 billion, $8 billion. And this is all public money. So if we are spending $8 billion and the rewards is optimistically, I would say, uh, in, in in terms of, you know, tens of millions of dollars, is this the best use of public money? Um, and as I said, when you look at ongoing operations, you know, um, summit jobs are projected to be 185 after construction for the whole region. Uh, so, you know, 
eight billion dollars for less than two hundred jobs. I think it's a it's a pretty steep price. I mean, uh, maybe we should just you know give two hundred people eight billion dollars and leave them home. Um, I think that um, um, it might actually be beneficial in environmental terms to do that. So, again, I want to emphasize that there is a big literature about these economic impact studies uh, and that uh, there is a, a, a lot of evidence that they inflate the numbers that they're used to sell to local communities projects that are not very good, but that require public funding. So here's the issue, right? They're trying to sell you something. They are not independently vetted. They're not peer reviewed. Um, and um, Again, this is a uh, professor Crompton is is a um, a professor at Texas A and M University, and he's been studying this um, issues extensively uh, in the area of sports construction, which is about as bad as pipelines in terms of uh, returns uh, to the public, uh, and and that the strategy of hiring the highfalutin consulting firm that then has all the disclaimers with all the numbers dependent on the um, uh, specific, uh, you know. Uh, private information of the company is is uh, is a well known mo, uh, and and it's this is not like it's, it's, it's if I were doing a study, which is independently vetted, goes through peer review, uh, and I really have to show my math to be um, based on facts uh, rather than uh, uh, you know desiderata or or wishes, um, and we know this because. In some cases, we've actually been able to compare the numbers that came out of the industry economic impact studies with independently vetted numbers. Uh, specifically, this happened in the case of the KSL, uh, Excel pipeline because it required a presidential permit. So the Department of State had to produce, uh, produce an independent study. And uh, this was the subject of this uh, report uh, from uh, Cornell University's uh, Global Labor Institute. And essentially, uh, you can see here that uh, the State Department numbers were nearly two thirds lower than the first Keystone Excel study. So going back to my second slide where I showed you the numbers that the final environmental impact statement for Minnesota had, um, taking things that Summit had put out at face value, can be incredibly problematic because when we have independent vetting, we know that these numbers aren't the same and they tend to be much lower, okay? So this is my first issue with the environmental um, impact statement that it really does not consider uh, the best available data and it uses the summit numbers as if they were, um, you know, real meaningful numbers. And what is more important is that we, when we have these economic impact studies, we're only look. I'm sorry, I think my cat is wants to participate into the webinar. Uh, when we look at uh, these economic impact studies, they only consider the benefits, right? And so we really need to think about the costs, which the um, environmental impact statement could have done a much better job of because we want to uh, look at whether we're using public money in the best possible way, okay? This is, as I said, a project that would not exist without public money. And so what is the opportunity cost? What are alternative uses of public money? Typically in economic impact studies, in environmental impact statements, you look at alternatives. Unfortunately, in this one, they didn't really look at meaningful alternatives except changing the route. This is a big problem. Uh, there were some questions in the chat about, uh, you know, the why is Minnesota the only state doing this? Uh, because the right scale to do this is not Minnesota. It's really the overall region, right? And we're looking at alternative ways of using those billions of dollars of taxpayer funds to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And unfortunately, um, uh, and Hudson can speak to this better than me, uh, there is no comprehensive environmental impact statement. But the Minnesota one doesn't really even address this fact. 
that it has to be contextualized in the you know in, within the broader uh, project. So opportunity costs. We could have spent this money differently. Um, what are better ways to spend the money? And uh, uh, I find this very uh, interesting uh, because actually uh, Wilkin County was the site of the FEMCO experiment uh, by uh, F.E. Murphy, who was the publisher of the Minneapolis Tribune. And in the 40s and 50s, he was heavily involved in this experiment to diversify farm operations and had these farms that were not just relying on wheat as a crop, but they were producing livestock and uh, had extensive crop rotation. And so what is the opportunity cost has to include the fact that if we have the pipeline, we're going to be producing a lot more corn for ethanol rather than diversifying our rural economies. And we're going to be doing so in Minnesota in one of the places where this diversification uh, has a long history of being experimented on. Uh, you know, you could argue that a better way to sequester carbon is to bring back pastures and to um, you know, plant more trees, plant more perennial uh, crops, uh, rather than investing billions of dollars into more corn production and associated ethanol production. And um, again, I, I think Sarah touched upon this, this whole, uh, the whole way in which the final environmental impact statement talked about climate change and carbon sequestration was quite disappointing. Um, in terms of, you know, this could happen or this could happen uh, and did not incorporate, for example, um, some of the most recent literature. This just came out uh, this year, right? And this is exactly what I'm talking about when I'm talking about uh, opportunity cost. Uh, and uh, this is from uh, um, Mark Jacobson, who's a professor at Stanford, and he's looking at how much... Um, uh, are we going to be able to avoid in terms of greenhouse gas emissions if we use uh, carbon sequestration um, with the, um, ethanol versus transitioning away from um, these, these energy sources and using more wind energy production? So uh, this is the big picture we need to look at. Um, otherwise, we're kind of like buying into the narrative of the industry uh, and not looking at the problem with the kind of like broad uh, vision that is required to really address uh, problems. Uh, so um, I want to uh, finish by talking a little bit about uh, land impacts. Uh, again, this is where also where I found the, the final um, statement disappointing because it said, you know, uh, you know that this is just going to be um, very little long-term effects. Uh, and uh, um, we have, again, evidence that shows, uh, this is from a study at Iowa State, that in the right of way, there are long-term impacts in terms of soil productivity. Uh, this is from uh, the, the Ohio, where uh, this, this, uh, this group has been doing a lot of work on um, uh, productivity impacts. And I would argue with you that one of the other examples that there are long-term impacts is in the landowner's opposition to the project because a lot of the landowners uh, who have gone to public hearings and have spoken up uh, actually had Dakota Access Pipeline right of ways on their land and are still seeing the impact of uh, these operations on their land, particularly when it comes to tile drainage. Uh, and disruption to tile uh, drainage systems. Uh, and, and they have not really, uh, you know, they have not really seen this things go away in a couple of years. I was also not happy with the way the um, environmental impact statement concluded there would be little too few impacts on uh, property values, because again, it was disregarding some of the most uh, recent literature. Um, this is a working paper. The working paper has now become a published paper that just came out this month. Unfortunately, the published paper is only limited to urban areas. But essentially what they find 
using this massive <clears throat> data set is that accidents do significantly reduce property values. They also find that information about the pipeline and the pipeline um, uh, uh, potential accidents is an important determinant of property values, which means that actually we are kind of like Schrodinger's cat because we're part of this process. We're making people more aware of the risks of the pipeline, which is likely going to impact the value of property uh, properties along the pipelines as we go forward. Um, if people have information, they tend to value that information and use it. Uh, and so uh, again, this idea that there are no impacts on property values is, is um, uh, probably not correct, okay? Um, so uh, this was a, a new approach because they had um, extensive data set, um, an extensive data set at a national level. So I would say uh, in terms of economic impacts overall, the, um, the environmental impact statement uh, overemphasized the benefits and underemphasized the costs uh, from a variety of perspectives and did not use the best available literature to make those claims, which I find very problematic. So I'm going to stop here um, and conclude by saying, yes, it is problematic as a whole that Minnesota is the only state that was doing an environmental impact statement. Given the amount of money that's being spent or proposed to be spent on these pipelines, certainly this warrants a, uh, a regional, you know, um, in scope uh, process that would consider more broadly alternatives and would consider more broadly uh, the costs uh, associated with the pipelines. Uh, I think even given the restrictive scope of the uh, Minnesota only statement, uh, they could have done a much better job at emphasizing uh, some of the potential problems and not taking the benefit claims at face value. Thank you. Thanks so much. Oh, I'm hopping in on your job. Sorry, Hudson. I just yes, my you are, <laughs> Sarah. I just I'm just jumping in to let people know that you should definitely put more questions in the Q and A for us. We have Sylvia here for this this hour, and she knows an awful lot about an awful lot of things. So feel free to throw in your questions. We do have some great ones. But first, Sarah is going to talk about the upcoming procedure and where we're going. So go take it away, Sarah. I will. Thank you. Oh, what did I, I have done something perhaps incorrect? There we go. Okay. We're on track. Thank you. All right. So lots of information coming at you, um, but here's kind of what you, for those who are interested in, you know, kind of continuing to keep up with this process in terms of process, what you want to know. So the Final environmental impact statement is out and available now. Um, happy to provide links to that for folks if you are interested. Um, but the opportunity for the public to comment on that final EIS is from now until September 11th at 4 p.m. Normally it's 4.30, but this time it's 4 p.m. Um, Cure is going to have a comment tool available soon. So, um, you know, again, reach out or if you're already um, in our network, uh, you'll be getting a notice about that soon, I'm sure. Um, but also important, there are some public meetings that are coming up very soon. Uh, there are going, there's going to be one on Tuesday, August 20th in Fergus Falls um, uh, from six to nine. It's at the Big Woods Event Center for anyone who's here and um, planning to go to that. Um, but then there's also a virtual one. Uh, the next day on Wednesday, August 21st, also from six to nine. I think those are generally kind of, I think it would go beyond that if necessary, but that's generally the amount of time we've been given. And then there are evidentiary hearings that are happening the days after that. So that's August 22nd and 23rd. And so the, those are different from the public meetings. Um, so at the public meetings, the administrative law judge, who's kind of going through um, the details of the final environmental impact statement, um, taking a look at that. So she will kind of moderate those discussions. So folks from the public can come in, say uh, concerns they have. Um, if they have questions, they'll be able to ask those. But then the evidentiary hearings are more for, uh, are just for folks who are 
generally just for folks who are party who are party to this kind of um, docket. Uh, so Cure has intervened and said, yeah, we have things we want to say about that. So that's how we've got people, folks like um, Sylvia, who provided some excellent written testimony um, about some of these issues. Um, so that's what the evidence you're hearing is about, talking to those experts, um, getting more information from them, from all the parties who submitted that kind of testimony. Um, and then this is just like a nice little chart that the final environmental impact statement has that kind of shows you what the process has been so far. The shaded ones are the ones that are already complete. So final EIS has been issued. Now we're looking at the public hearing comment period. Um, and then there'll be kind of this final this final section here. And um, the FEIS says that generally we would anticipate some sort of decision on the permit application underlying all of this discussion um, by the end of the year. Uh, okay, that is all for me. So, so just to emphasize one thing that Sarah said, normally for a Minnesota EIS, you would get a maximum of 10 days from when it was published to do your comments. So we would currently be almost at the end of the comment period, but we and you have until September 11th, so not even this month, next month, um, to file comments on the FEIS. And so there's there's a big um, opportunity there for folks who are interested in this, whether they live in Minnesota or not, to have their voices heard on this project and the, and the potential for impacts to it. Um, and I think that leads us, my, my comment, whether they're in Minnesota or not, and uh, gets us to our first question, which I think Sarah maybe is, is itching to answer. Curious why this environmental review is the only environmental review happening on this project. So I think implicitly this person is saying, why is it only the 28 mile segment and not the full 2000 miles plus? Sarah? Excellent question. Um, so a couple, well, <laughs> We, we tried to tell the uh, Public Utilities Commission that, hey, maybe you should look at um, at least much larger in terms of Minnesota. So I'll take this kind of in two parts. So the reason Minnesota is the only one doing an environmental impact statement is we're the only state that's kind of um, decided to make that required. Um, other states, uh, so like in Nebraska, they do more of the permitting at the local level. Here we are doing the permit for the route um, at the Public Utilities Commission, so at the state level. Um, but then North Dakota, South Dakota, and Iowa um, just don't have the same environmental um, review requirements that we do. And I will say, you know, at the beginning of all this, which was, I think, almost two years ago now, um, the applicant did kind of want to try and get a, a lighter environmental review, um, something that's, you know, easier, um, doesn't look as detailed as an FEIS should, um, but we were able to kind of um, you know, cure other partners and, and members of the public were able to say, mm, hold on a second, this is going to be the largest pipeline of its kind. We've never seen these before in Minnesota. And you think that you don't have to take a close look? No. Um, so that's why Minnesota is the only one. That's just the way our laws are written uh, compared to the other states. Why did they not look at all 240 plus miles in Minnesota? Well, we tried to tell them um, that you really should because we know um, Summit has um, easements already picked out. They have a route pretty definitively planned um, in the lower part of the state. It's not a question of um, if it's going to happen. It's more, you know, or when the, if they're going to apply, it's when. Um, but because Summit didn't submit an application um, right when they did for the this Otter Tail the Wilkin part, the Public Utilities Commission said, we don't need to look at that. Um, we obviously feel very differently. This is um, clearly what we think is something called a phased action. It's part one of a multi-part process. Um, so it's pretty clearly told us that. So Public Utilities Commission decided, nope, we're not going to do it that way. So that's that's kind of what we're left with now. Yeah, and I'm gonna I'm gonna say in response to another question we got, and I'll read that out loud. Are there any precedents for how permitting addresses proposals that are clearly planned to be larger than what's under consideration? I believe that has come up with the PolyMet and their statements to investors indicating the intent to expand significantly. Are there others? Um, as Sarah just said, Minnesota's environmental review law specifically has um, standards for phased and connected actions. And generally, our view is that this, this whole pipeline, at least the entire network that's proposed for Minnesota, should have been reviewed together. That's what the law appears to say. And um, CURE not only 
uh, stated that clearly on the record, but also um, protested when the PUC decided not to do that. So, so it's something that could be, um, you know, go before court at a later date potentially. Um, but yeah, there's definitely a Minnesota rule that says you should assess all phased and connected actions together so, so that the project doesn't get segmented into teeny tiny reviews. Um, now the questions are happening fast and furious. Um, let's see, where to go next? Dale's question, can, can we get the FEIS or administrative law judge to consider the alternatives of diversifying crops or using renewable energy to convert captured CO2 to sustainable aviation fuels? Um, I'm gonna start that answer and then, and then pitch it over to Sylvia. So Dale, uh, you can comment on that for sure and, and uh, bring it up as an issue that was perhaps not adequately addressed in the FEIS. They did um, discuss uh, climate smart agriculture, but they generally only seem to discuss that in terms of growing more corn. So they didn't really talk about crop diversification. Um, and, and yeah, these are, these are issues that, um, may not have been in the scope that the, the PUC approved in January of this year, but that is certainly not a limit on what, what you could say in your, in your comments on September 11th. Um, Sylvia, do you have thoughts on on the impacts of of perhaps moving away from all corn agriculture or 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 even using the CO two for something else? Yeah, I mean, I think this is, uh, you know, as you well know, Hudson. If you look at NEPA, the environmental uh, um, statute that governs these these environmental impact statements at the federal level, right? What is critical is to include meaningful alternatives. And certainly this would be a really important, meaningful alternative, which would have a lot of environmental co-benefits, right? And the fact that nothing like this was included. So there were some questions at the beginning about the scoping process, right? I think the scoping um, was very restrictive here and, and did not include these kind of like broad alternatives, because think about it, if we had eight billion dollars to uh you know subsidize diversified agriculture and and things like more wind turbines and alternative fuels uh we might decide that actually it is more socially beneficial to go that route rather than uh build the co2 pipelines so uh certainly i would say this is a flaw in the that shows again how restrictive uh, the Minnesota process has been and artificially restricting the alternative space is a mark of a not very good environmental impact state. Awesome. Thank you, Sylvia. There's two um, very closely linked questions here, and I'm going to knock those out real quick. So one question, since federal dollars are funding this, why is there no federal oversight of environmental impacts? Why isn't NEPA at, at issue here, the law that Sylvia just brought up? And then someone else asks, is the Summit Pipeline income source just the IRA? And so this project stands to make many billions of dollars off of taxpayers, but they but they are not seeking grants. So, so they are not getting any grant money or even loans, as far as I'm aware, from the federal government. They are trying to build this project without federal funding. And then the income will be through tax credits for every ton buried underground. So the income, the reason to build it is federal funding and tax credits paid to Summit and the ethanol plants. But they're actually avoiding federal environmental review for the entire network by not applying for this money. And if you look at other carbon capture things that are very summit carbon pipeline adjacent, they are getting very big grants. So the Project Tundra in North Dakota, for example, plans to hook into the summit pipeline, but it is taking tens and, and potentially hundreds of millions of taxpayer dollars in grants, and they have to do federal review, whereas summit is only subject to state and local review because it's avoiding that, that um, you know, potential large amount of money from the federal government. All right. Um, Tess has That's a question. Good. Yeah, go ahead. The, so, there was the other question about whether the money was only coming from the IRA, and the answer is no. 
because the other thing that they want to do here is they want to sell the ethanol to California because the ethanol produced with a carbon capture and sequestration will have a lower carbon intensity and so can be sold at a premium to the California market. I would argue that that is what we call double dipping. That means they're getting paid twice for doing the same thing. If we are paying for the sequestration, they shouldn't get extra money from California for having a lower carbon intensity product because we've mm -hmm. already paid for that. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. this is another really good example of how these state and federal policies are disjointed. And so we don't get mm -hmm. the, if you will, socially optimum outcome because California can do what they want without federal oversight. And they only care about their own processes, their own numbers, rather than what happens at a, a, a larger scale. And so what they're doing is not necessarily meaningful and it's not necessarily that money they're spending uh, to subsidize this um, processes uh, are not really uh, adding any uh, carbon sequestration uh, to the table. They're just making Summit richer. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, thank you for that point, Sylvia. I, I'm gonna turn it back and give you a, a meaty question. Has anyone proposed or started an independent study of the effects of large pipelines on farmland and rural property values or their impact on future housing and commercial development along pipeline routes? I feel like you might know the answer to that, Sylvia. Yes. Unfortunately, the problem is that, um, as, as you probably know, uh, a lot of these uh, this information happens at the local, county, or state level. And so it would be incredibly expensive to assemble the database. Uh, you know, some of our Iowa counties don't even have information digitized. So if you wanted to look at sales values for rural properties, for example, it would be very difficult. I'm not saying it couldn't be done, but we're talking about a major study that would cost millions of dollars. And of course, you can only do the study ex post facto after uh, this is in place, right? And so this is a big problem that we are going to find the evidence uh, and it's going to be too late to really use that evidence to inform the process. Uh, I expect, you know, somebody is going to write a big meaty set of papers 10 years from now if the pipelines get built to show how bad they were. I kind of like did the same thing uh, 15 years ago now, telling people ethanol is going to be bad for the environment. And I predicted it using uh, scenario models. And now everybody's like, oh, ethanol is bad for the environment, uh, but ethanol is here. Um, excellent. Well, depressing, but also excellent. Um, Sarah, uh, do you expect Summit will apply for the rest of the network before they construct this segment? Is it realistic that this segment could be a standalone or would they not bother if the rest doesn't also get permitted? Great question. Um, so I think purely guessing, I think they'll probably wait um, until if if they get to see if they get a permit for this section. Um, I think then if they get the permit, they'll probably apply right away for the other ones. They won't wait till this part is constructed. I could be wrong. Kind of depends on what happens in other states, but that would be my um, my my guess. Um, it's hard. I I don't know the math. Um, I don't know how they could make it pencil out uh, to just have because it's only connecting one ethanol plant um, and it goes directly through. I think it. I'd have to look at the North Dakota map again. It might pick up a second ethanol plant in North Dakota, but it's not. Um, so it would be a fairly low volume of CO two, from what I understand. If if they got the permit for the Otter Tail to Wilkin and and only did that. Um, and only had that one ethanol plant in North Dakota too. Um, so it'd be a lot of money for what might not be a payoff. So hard to say. Um, I think they're looking for the whole thing, um, if, if possible. Hopefully that answers yeah. your question. <laughs> and then one interesting thing um, also might be that because they're doing this with private financing, they're always talking about how they're going to submit the next uh, application. They keep pushing it back, but they continuously announce that they are going to submit the the application for the two other segments in Minnesota. But because this process is ongoing, there's an obvious reason for them to not submit it while they're still trying to get this first segment. So it's it's a very strange situation where 
they keep telling their investors that they are on the brink of getting all of the segments, but they're, they've told the Public Utilities Commission that it's perfectly all right to just do environmental review for this one segment because it's fully independent of the other parts. Obviously, if they don't get their permits in Iowa or North Dakota, then <laughs> they're not going to build a, a darn thing. So um, the fact that they have had um, their permits rejected in North Dakota already um, and have had to go back is a, has been a significant set, setback for their plans. Um, but it didn't stop the Minnesota process. We did we did ask the uh, Public Utilities Commission to pause while the North Dakota segment was unpermitted, and and they didn't see any point in doing that either. Hudson, can I add to uh, what you just said? that it's been really interesting to see how in North Dakota, uh, they're really selling the project as an AEOR, Enhanced Oil Recovery Project, because I think they think that that might uh, be more palatable uh, to get the permit over there, while here it's being sold in a different way. So the same kind of thing that you were saying in terms of like speaking to the investors versus uh, speaking to the, the regulators, you know, it, there is a lot of mixed signals here and there is no guarantee that one set of actions will happen rather than another because there's nothing mandating them to do so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and we definitely did update our comment on the DEIS uh, for the public statements that Summit's representative made in North Dakota saying that that this project would help the, the oil recovery industry in, in North Dakota going forward. So yeah, definitely true, Sylvia. Um, I am going to sneak in a question about um, about the the public safety uh, issue that Sarah talked about. So so we know that when these things have um, ruptured in the past, it can um, push out a huge amount of CO two because it's under really high pressure, um, and and often the company's modeling of that has been secret, and there's been a big fight in states like South Dakota to get any information at all about how big the, the cloud of suffocating carbon dioxide would be. So Sarah, can you tell us a little bit more about what kind of modeling is publicly available in this process and what, what your expert, what CARES expert um, said about that modeling? Sure. Um, so as far as I know, the only modeling that has been made um, publicly available is what are um, the, the, is what's in this docket. Um, so the Department of Commerce, who is doing the final environmental impact statement, hired um, an outside party to do modeling um, of what a potential rupture or leak might look like um, and what might happen. So that's the only one that I know of that is publicly available. Um, and that's not, from my understanding, the same as what, say, Summit is maybe running um, behind the scenes. So they've had, like Hudson said, multiple fights um, in other states um, trying to get Summit to make that public. Um, and as far as I know, has not been successful. A lot of things about trade secrets, national security, things like that. Those are the terms being thrown about um, to say that this is, it doesn't need to be made or it can't be made public. Um, so we had uh, our, one of our experts take a look at it. Um, well, so the modeling, the thing about CO2 from my non-scientific background, what I've been told by people much smarter than me, um, is that it doesn't, uh, it doesn't behave the way other things that we're used to ha being in, having in pipelines. Um, it doesn't behave the way those things do because it's being transported as a supercritical um, entity. So it's got fluid and gaseous properties. Um, but then if there's a rupture, um, it kind of changes phase very quickly. So it just looks different from say an oil pipeline, a spill, um, or even hydrogen or anything that we're maybe, uh, natural gas that we're maybe more used to. So there are some modeling programs out there. Um, but they're, you know, how useful they are, whether they're, you know, going to be helpful and good um, and valid for this kind of larger project, I think remains to be seen. Because again, this is the first of its kind, the world's largest. So there's this program called Canary. That's what was used in this particular instance. Um, pretty common um, uh, program to be used. And then also computational fluid dynamic uh, modeling, CFD modeling, again, way beyond my area of even knowledge, expertise, anything. Um, but so we have an expert who came in and took a look at that for us. He is an expert, an actual expert um, in CFD. Uh, and so we kind of 
pointed out a couple big issues. You know, it's not clear from the, what was pro produced as an attachment to the FEIS, um, whether uh, the modeling was verified or validated. Um, again, like I kind of mentioned in my earlier in my presentation, a lot of the assumptions um, aren't really explained why they were chosen over others. Um, things like, um, again, like wind speed and direction. Um, and then I've also heard from experts at the federal level or national level who do this kind of modeling, um, that it's it can be particularly tough um, because the model is has to take into account so many things, elevation, um, kind of like what is the profile of the of the land over which the CO2 might flow. So is it rough terrain? Is it smooth? That kind of thing. Are there peaks and valleys? Um, and so all those things together, you know, our expert kind of said, I can't tell if they did these things, if they made these assumptions correctly. Um, and so it's really hard to know if the end results of what the potential impact radius might be is true, if that would actually be a safe zone for people, um, or if these people within, um, you know, 600 feet would be very in trouble, if the people further out would be still in trouble, or if it's even beyond what we think. Um, is it thousands of feet? Is it miles? We don't know based on you know, kind of the lack of detail about the assumptions that were used in the modeling. Um, that was really detailed, sorry. That's okay. We're gonna knock off a, a couple of quick other ones too. Um, so to, to whoever's ready to answer it, does Summit have other projects proposals besides this one network? Mm -hmm. Well, Summit has is investing a lot of money in sustainable aviation fuels. And this is kind of like, I see it personally as kind of like part of that bigger plan. And so the idea is um, that they are really trying hard with the support of USDA. Uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, Secretary Vilsack's son is counsel for summit. Um, so I, I think there's a little bit of conflict of interest there, but uh, you know, what do I know? Um, so summit essentially, and, and a lot of people in kind of like big ag, see sustainable aviation fuels from corn and soybeans as uh, the next big thing once the internal combustion engine disappears or is taken over by electric vehicles for, uh, you know, the cars. Uh, and so having the CO2 pipelines would help improve the environmental profile of uh, corn and, and soybean products uh, in would because these these uh, uh, sustainable aviation fuels, it's not just uh, like it's happening for other things in the US that we just decide this is climate smart uh, without any evidence. Uh, it ha there is a process, an international uh, model, uh, you know, international communities involved. And so they hope that these kind of uh, things like more conservation practices, you, uh, growing corn and soybeans, the CO2 pipelines will make uh, corn and soybean based uh, aviation fuels sustainable. And then they have an international market that is likely to exist for a very, very long time. Uh, so uh, I think I, I see these uh, sets of actions as being very uh, related. And by the way, if the ethanol that summit uh, you know, pipes the CO2 from uh, is grown with conservation practices that we have paid for through subsidies. Uh, I would say that's triple dipping, uh, right? Because essentially they're going to be able to sell at a premium and then possibly get sustainable aviation fuel subsidies uh, for all these things that we have paid for multiple times. Yeah, and that's that's like the conservation improvement program that's coming from USDA. So we're already paying for these practices, and then Sylvia is saying that they are going to reap the the reward as profit. Um, there is a question here: Would these carbon dioxide pipelines ever be connected to other facilities other than ethanol? I think Sylvia has the great example of sustainable aviation fuel being the next big thing for them. But yes, in addition to that. If you build it, they will come, right? Um, there, There is the potential that industrial sites of other sorts would hook in. There's the possibility that coal, there's, like I said, Project Tundra in North Dakota is a coal plant that would like to be connected to the summit pipeline. 
um, those things will be a little more um, difficult for them to reap the CO2 off of. The ethanol and sustainable aviation fuel plants have a pure form of CO2, but they, they have worked out um, technology to take some of the CO2 off of a coal plant or potentially off of a cement plant or even in Minnesota from a, from an iron uh, an iron smelt smelting is not the right word, but uh, a furnace, a blast furnace. Um, so yes, uh, once once there's a network made, other things will hook up to it. But currently, the proposal is just for ethanol plants. Um, I do think that we have reached the end of our hour, um, and I will uh, allow you know Sarah and Sylvia any final thoughts um, before we sign off. I do not. I know there are some folks in the chat um, and Q&A who have uh, questions that we didn't get to answer. And I know some of you, so I will reach out um, separately to you. Um, but just want to say big thanks to Sylvia for being here today, too. Well, I, I really appreciate that Minnesota um, at least has a process, right? Uh, and that, that has allowed uh, some discovery to happen about some of these things that we are really not seeing in Iowa and, and we're much going to be much more impacted than you are. Uh, and so I think informing the public about these things is, is paramount because I think we're spending a lot of money without really understanding what the impacts of these things are going to be. And, and, uh, and so it's important that we look, to, look into this more closely. So thank you. All right. Thanks, everyone.